So today we have experts on, and I will let each one of you uh, introduce yourself to speak about human trafficking um, or commercial sexual exploitation, as you know, a lot of uh, professionals call it. And you know, I think it's important for darkness to light. I will frame it that. You know, well, you talk about child sexual abuse. Why would you, you know, sort of engage in the human trafficking conversation? Well, we know that 70 to 90 percent of those who are trafficked commercially are first exploited non commercially. Um, and part of what traffickers prey on is the vulnerability, the lack of boundaries um, that were established when these individuals were first hurt non commercially. And so I will jump um, and introduce our first guest, which is Nicole Epps from World Childhood Foundation. Um, Nicole, I would love for you to talk about your work, uh, World Childhood Foundation, and how you are connected back to uh, this issue of human trafficking. Sure. Hello, everyone. And thank you so much, Darkness to Light, for having myself and the World Childhood Foundation participate. Uh, my name is Nicole Epps. I'm the executive director of the World Childhood Foundation USA, which was a foundation created 22 years ago by Her Majesty Queen Sylvia of Sweden to inspire, promote, and develop solutions to end child sexual abuse and exploitation. We do that by supporting programs that provide prevention training and direct services to children and their non-offending -fam non family members throughout the United States. We have served over 90,000 um, children and families throughout our history. Personally, I have spent, prior to working at Childhood USA, over a decade working in anti-trafficking, specifically nationally and internationally, working with young women and girls who've been in the life and helping them reintegrate into our community. And it is, as you shared, Caitlin, our highest uh, vocation and our passion is to ensure not only are we creating and supporting protective environments to keep our children safe, but we're also keeping them free from exploitation. So thank you again for having us. No, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. For those of you who have just joined, we're here today with some amazing experts talking about human trafficking. Um, a couple of housekeeping things, just to let you know, all participants are muted. Again, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A feature on Zoom or in the comment feature on Facebook, um, and we'll try and get all your questions answered. Uh, know that this is a safe space, um, and we will talk about some, some things that might trigger you. And so, if you need to talk to someone, please do not hesitate. We provide free resources. Please dial 1-866-4LIGHT or text the word LIGHT to 741-741. And you can find both of those. My team will help uh, out and put those in the chat. Um, and again, this video will be available today live from Zoom and Facebook, but we will also put it into Spanish. Uh, so anyone who uh, is bilingual or uh, have first language Spanish, we'll be able to, to access that. So Sarah, I'd love to jump to you and have you introduce yourself. Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us. I am extremely excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, you know, this is extremely personal for me. I'm a human trafficking survivor, and I also grew up in the foster care system where I experienced um, both physical and sexual abuse. Um, you know, I, I've dedicated um, practically the, you know, working on the past year of my life um, to create education and awareness on human trafficking, on child sexual abuse material. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, you know, it's been a wonderful journey because we have the opportunity to educate and enlighten so many people on a very, very sensitive topic. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're thrilled to have you. And last but not least, Eliza uh, from Nick Mick, we'd love to have you um, talk about who you are and how you come to this work. Um, hi, everybody. I'll start by saying I'm Eliza Riach, and I am a dog owner. So as we all give each other grace in these wild times, I'm very sorry if Henry barks in the background. Okay. Uh, I have been working um, to address child sex trafficking since 2007 uh, in Atlanta. And back then, 
unfortunately, the Fulton County Court had the child prostitution court. Um, I'm excited to say in the state of Georgia, as well as now in most states in the country, we are no longer charging children with the crime of prostitution because we recognize that that is something that is really counterintuitive. It doesn't exist. And that, you know, had the opportunity to work more on the national level over the years um, to really make sure that we're defining the fact that child sex trafficking is child abuse. Um, And so I work as now as a strategic advisor on child sex trafficking to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which is just a thrill. Our mission is to find missing children, reduce sexual exploitation, and uh, prevent future victimization. And so while you don't hear child sex trafficking in our name, being the clearinghouse on those types of cases, I think we've likely been serving this population since we opened our doors. Yeah, I mean, I'll jump right in and pose the first question to you, Eliza. You know, Nick Mick reported to receive more than 17,000 reports of possible child sex trafficking in 2020 alone. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, about specifically what is child sex trafficking and online sexual exploitation of children and what do those reports look like, particularly during the age of COVID? Absolutely. Um, so ch- child sex trafficking, as defined, is any person under the age of 18 that is uh, exploited, advertised, or solicited through a commercial sex act, which means the exchange of anything of value, not just money, but that could be drugs, shelter, a place to stay. Um, And so one of the things that's really important is Nick Nick uses the federal definition under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act to acknowledge is that when we're talking about over the age of 18, there is a requirement to prove force, fraud, or coercion when talking about a commercial sex act. That doesn't apply for young people under the age of 18 because it is already assumed because they are a minor. Um, So really important for us as well because it, it has great implications to the fact that we don't have to prove a child has a traffic car to be considered a victim of trafficking. And not only is that respectful of uh, a child's to honor whatever kind of tra- traumatic bonding might be happening or victimhood that they're experiencing to say, you know, that their um, services and access to support doesn't hinge on disclosing that there was a trafficker involved in their abuse. Um, and so broadly, like you said, Uh, We received over 17,000 cases of child sex trafficking last year. Um, And just like so many others, I think it really, um, our response shifted as we started to name it. And so up until around 2008, NCMEC really worked in silos. We had our exploited children's division and our missing children division. And it wasn't until um, that time where we saw the rise of online exploitation of children on websites like Craigslist or Backpage, that all of a sudden we were getting tips on our cyber tip lines that were directly related to children <coughs> missing child caseload. And what we also, oh, there's Henry. I, I promise you'd hear him. Hi, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, uh, but that, you know, what we also realized is that we needed to think through our response a little uh, differently, whereas When we talked about cases previously, when you're talking about finding imagery of a child being abused online or a child who's been abducted, um, the term rescue applies. But in these cases, we're talking about children who may not necessarily be considering themselves victims or asking for help. And so our response looks a lot different. But we say it's not necessarily rescue, but thinking through more that idea, especially as we are recognizing child abuse and mandates to report child sex trafficking, and more importantly, in foster care, children missing from care, both to law enforcement and to NCMEC. So in 2007, when I was doing this work in Atlanta, not only was there no requirement to report a child missing from state care, it was actually policy that if that child had been in ex- ex- on, sorry, expanded, had run away, basically, um, that we would close their case after two and a half weeks, which meant if that hadn't been reported to Nick Nick, literally nobody was looking for that child except for somebody who wanted to exploit them. So I think, you know, when framing this issue too, and broadly when we're talking about missing and exploited children, 
also trying to reframe that conversation of when a child runs away, that that is not a label, it's a behavior. And often it's an indicator of something else that might be going on. If the child's running away multiple times or for long periods of time, we should be thinking that that child is either running from something or being lured to something. Mm -hmm. So that frames the issue a little bit more broadly. Um, we have a lot of stats that we share on our website. For instance, one in six of the young people we serve are like uh, that have run away from home are likely victims of trafficking. 7% of our suspected child sex trafficking victims are male. Um, all of those kinds of information um, is helpful for us to think through prevention and understanding. Um, but it's also really important to talk about while we have an opportunity because of the types of cases we see and the reports that we're working to share and learn from that data that we also need to recognize what it doesn't represent. Unfortunately, mm. a child doesn't need to be moved or even leave their home to be a victim of child sex trafficking. So we know that there are some children that may be being exploited by their family members, unfortunately, mm. or that they may have said, mom, dad, you know, uh, stepdad's abusing me or I don't care what it says on my birth certificate I know I'm a woman and they mm -hmm. say get out of my house those mm -hmm. are kids that aren't necessarily reported missing to Nick Nick and we want to make sure that as I kind of share some data um, today that we frame it in the context of it's it is who's reported missing to Nick Nick more broadly uh, those 17,000 cases are part of over uh, 18 million reports of sexual exploitation that Nick Nick received last year and I can talk a little bit more about that, but I know I don't want to spend too much time in my. Yeah, no, you framed it so well. I mean, Eliza, I think you said three really interesting. I mean, you said a lot of interesting things, but three <laughs> really main points. One is that, you know, as we grow and learn as a society, we need to continue to look at the structures and the policies that we have as institutions to make sure that we do not have policies that actually unintentionally hurt um, those who are currently being trafficked. Um, Two, you know, I think common misconceptions um, of trafficking is that you have to cross an international border, that, you know, it, it's taken, it, the movie taken, it's, you know, it's this big dramatic affair where in all, you know, in many cases, these kids are being trafficked um, and they live at home. Um, and, and so we need, to, we need to sort of unpack what some of those stereotypes are around trafficking. Um, and three, I think that, you know, again, the common mis misconception that people just sort of fall into this, that there aren't other things that are happening in their lives um, that potentially push them to be more vulnerable, such as abuse at home or whatever. Um, and so we need to think holistically about trafficking and not just about how to save them or, or, or rescue them. Um, that's, we don't, we don't want to get to that point. We want to prevent it from ever happening. So you know, based on that misconception, Sarah, I want to, I want to ask you, you know, obviously, um, you've had your personal experience, and what do you think, as you have started to do this advocacy work, what are some of the common misconceptions that you have conversations about with people, you know, with online sexual exploitation and trafficking for parents? Like, what would, a, what do parents constantly ask you, and you're like, no, that's not it. So the biggest question that I'm posed with more often than not is, does this actually happen? You know, is this just something we, we see in TV shows, you know, speaking in terms of human trafficking, or, you know, we read in a book and it, it's supposed to, you know, scare our children. But the misconception is it's, it's a very real dangerous issue. It, it's yeah. something that affects a lot of people. And you brought up a good point, actually. Speaking in terms of vulnerability, a lot of times when someone is sexually exploited or trafficked, it is because they are more vulnerable. There could be something else going on in life. It could be something with mental health. It could be school, family. Maybe they're getting bullied. Maybe they're having um, gender identity. You know, they're trying to explore. Um, there are there are so many different things that contribute to this, and I think you know, with parents especially, is just being open, being honest. 
not putting, you know, a veil over, not trying to, you know, glorify or um, make human trafficking into, you know, this demon it is, but we need to actually help children realize that this is real. It's not a fallacy. It's not fake. It's not something that just happens on TV. Mm -hmm. It's, it's something that, you know, someone close to you could be preying on a child. It could be, you know, a cousin, an uncle, a coach, you know, whatever it may be. We've heard almost everything. Um, so there, you know, with the, with the misconceptions, I think the most important thing is breaching the conversation with children in a way that allows them to understand that this is something that causes pain mm -hmm. and can immensely affect you and your family. Um, there, there can be a sense of isolation. And I think that's, um, you know, it's, it's tricky because you want someone to feel supported, but if they're isolating, chances are they may not reach out to you as a parent or a guardian. So the biggest thing, you know, that I like to speak about is having supports in place mm -hmm. so that if you can't have that uncomfortable conversation, well, can someone else have it? You know, whether, whether the parent or guardian is there or, you know, they pre-approve it. Um, so, you know, we need to stop, you know, lying to children and saying that, you know, this can't happen because it, it does. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very, it's a very real issue. And later on, I'll go in to talk about a little bit more of my story, but I was groomed online for, you know, years, mm -hmm. years before I was taken. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, um, you know, with the misconceptions, I think it's, it's really about being truthful and honest and not putting a shield over things. Yeah, I mean, you make a number of good points. I think that child-focused and adult-focused education is critical. Uh, we need to be educating all age groups um, and organizations that do, you know, that work need to be collaborating in order to help what, what we would call a safe adult, right? So it might not be a parent or a caregiver. It might be someone else in their life that they consider safe. Um, and we don't say trusted for a very specific reason because a lot of times kids trust the people who end up um, hurting them and exploiting them. So one of the other points you made was that there's no community that is immune from this. And so Nicole, I wanna, I wanna bring you into the conversation and I sort of expand on that idea that no community is immune. Like, are there some communities that are more vulnerable? You know, can you talk about common risk factors and, and uh, where, where experts and safe adults might see additional vulnerabilities? Sure, so, you know, I, I think that is one of the hardest questions that we're asked <laughs> professionally and personally. Uh, I, on some days, I really want to share and say, look in the mirror, look at your family, look at the children in your family. Um, they are vulnerable. Our children are all vulnerable. I think that there are some risk factors that can increase or heighten the risk. And those risk factors are illuminating the marginalization that we have within our community. And that marginalization can come from income inequality, insecure housing, um, unstable family lives, and this affects all of us. And, you know, one of the things when we're having this conversation, I think it's really important to acknowledge that choices are made and they're not made because people are trying to make poor choices or bad decisions. Sometimes we're making the best decisions we can when we're in a difficult place. And so that's this conversation we have when we talk about child sexual abuse or we're talking about exploitation. We make decisions based on our family of origin, our family of creation, 
And all of these choices are part of, you know, the socio-ecological model of the different contexts and the different identities we have in different spaces that we all have to navigate. Mm -hmm. I think what's also really important to add in the conversation as we talk about having responsible adults and having conversations, which are so important, but also the role of youth in these conversations. While I think we can all agree that youth, the youth in our lives, they are not responsible for the choices that they make. I would never want to be judged on choices I myself made um, in my, my teen life. I think my mom is on this, so she'll probably share that with you as well. But what I would like to say, it's something that I have kept with me for years. Uh, when I started working in this space, I, I was part of a girls group counseling and they were survivors who just left the life. And so they were thinking about new plans. And one of the girls said, you know, when I was about seven or eight, I shared with my best friend that I was being sexually abused at home. And my best friend at the time said to me, don't worry, this happens to everyone. That has stuck with me for many, many years because I've always thought to myself, what would the tra trajectory of life have been if at that moment her friend had tools or maybe the education to know to find an adult to mm -hmm. speak to, to not normalize this behavior? And I think so much of this conversation, whether we're talking about abuse or exploitation, and I would make the argument that exploitation is abuse mm -hmm. and it is constant and unrelenting abuse and re-triggering assault and violence. But if you do not know to have the conversation, and most importantly, if you don't know where to go, then it's not enough to talk about our response. It's not enough to talk about prevalence or what communities if we're not providing these resources. So I think it's just of you know the utmost importance for childhood. That's why we partner with Darkness to Light, Nick Mac, Sarah. I'm so glad to be here with you as well. Just to have these resources to amplify these, because you never know when you're going to be in a conversation or someone will need something. And hopefully, all of, everyone who's listening will think, okay, the next time you know I, I sat in this you know this webinar today, and and now I have three organizations and and names where I can look for information. So I think that's just something I wanted to share. That's beautiful, Nicole. And again, I wanna remind everybody on the call, uh, we do have free resources. If anything that's talked about today um, is in fact triggering, so you can call one 4 light And you can also text the word LIGHT to 741741. Um, and those are free resources. You'll be connected with counselors. I know sometimes there's a little weight on the hotline, so don't give up, um, but those resources are available for you today. and. Um, you will receive an email with all of the information from World Childhood, from Nick Nick, from Darkness Slate on additional resources uh, to be able to, to continue the education and also hopefully to find help if you in fact are being abused or trafficked. Um, Sarah, I want to go back to you for a second. You know, one of the things that Nicole talked about a little bit was the grooming process and sort of how that uh, that experience comes to pass. I mean, so many times we hear stories about those who are non-commercially or commercially sexually exploited where you didn't realize the grooming was even happening, right? And so this, again, goes back to child-focused education and what Nicole was, was mentioning. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's in person or online. Um, can you share with us a little bit about your own personal experience and how the grooming sort of shaped what happened to you? Of course. So I had no idea what grooming was. Um, I experienced being groomed for a matter of years. Um, and, you know, it started off extremely innocent. It was um, a friend request through, you know, Facebook. Um, and at that time, I, you know, was a young teenager. So, having friends, you know, was important to me. So I would add people, people I've never met. And, you know, that was, that was normal to me. That was okay. Um, what I didn't know is that, you know, my interest in seeking a connection with people put me in a pretty vulnerable position because I was, um, you know, staying up late, not sleeping, stay, you know, checking messages and 
there were, you know, some that caught my attention, I would respond, but, you know, more, more particularly, um, there was um, a guy who reached out to me and, you know, we started talking. I, I told them about, you know, I, I think I was reading Harry Potter at the time or something along the lines. And, you know, we were, we, it felt like we were making a connection and it felt genuine and honest. And, you know, this didn't happen overnight. This was over a matter of years. So we would go through periods of reaching out and talking and, you know, I would, you know, not end up responding or messaging back for a while and then, you know, back to responding and things like that. And it, it was, a ma you know, when you think about making a friend, it's, you know, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite food? You know, what are your hobbies? What are your interests? And that's exactly what this experience was like. It didn't feel, um, it, it didn't feel malicious in, in any way, um, which is why predators, you know, get away with this because they have the ability to mask their identity. This man, you know, was in his forties and had me believing that he was my age mm. and, you know, 13, 14, somewhere around there. And, you know, to think of it, to think about that in, in a right state of mind, the fact that someone, a grown adult, is, is portraying themselves as a, a teenager to, you know, make friends. You know, if I would have just had a little bit of knowledge on, um, you know, online safety or, you know, what, um, you know, what to do if someone's reaching out to me that I don't know, you know, is it appropriate to just respond back to everyone? Probably not. Um, so, you know, the, the grooming process for me, it was, it was a long, long process. And it was, you know, he was there for the end game. And the end game was to traffic me from Boston at gunpoint to New York City, where I was held and sexually trafficked and that that experience that grooming process it didn't stop when I met him in person it actually kept going because the more comfortable I got I you know I would pull back here and there and then it would be you know coming back in and coercing me and just you know just having the overall environment be calmer. Um, and um, sorry. Yeah, what you're describing sounds like, you know, when even when we think about domestic violence, that sort of cyclical, um, you know, back and forth of a, a traumatic situation, an apology, recovery, like, so it, it's, it, it, there are very similar patterns, it sounds like, um, that you felt with your abuser, the same way that maybe a, a, a married couple might experience um, in terms of a domestic violence situation. Nicole, it looks like you want to join. I just, you know, it, it's uh, Sarah, so thank you so much for sharing. And, and when you were speaking, it was the same thought, and it's something that we think a lot about in this work is that these are relationships, you know, statistically, it's not always, you know, a gorilla pimp or someone steals you when you go with your best friend to Paris and you're in an apartment and taken, right? The reality is, is that you're forming a relationship. You know, many of the girls that I worked with, they did not identify as being exploited. They were very proud of the fact that they were supporting their stable or their family that they had sister wives in the life and that this was their family obligation. And so when we're also talking about grooming, we also have to talk about the loss of stability and the need to belong because we all wanna belong. We all wanna have a family. And so in the beginning, there's something beautiful and let's think about this developmentally if we're talking about teenagers, right? You want to feel beautiful. You want someone to see the things that are so interesting. If you have a bad day in school or at home, here's one person who's really listening to you and they get you. And so 
I think part of the conversation we have when we're talking about prevention needs to also be a discussion about healthy relationships. What do healthy relationships look like? Sarah, is a healthy relationship, should you be, you know, should we be having conversations at 2 a.m., right? When we discover, you know, it, it's at any age, like at 16, what does a 40 year old want to talk to a 16 year old about? Is there anything that they really should have in common? And so I think it's so important that our education includes language that's not shaming and it's not judgmental, but it's also providing concrete examples of what healthy relationship looks like, what healthy conversations look like. So that when you're in that situation, and I would argue whether you're online or offline, there are moments where you can say, wait a second, we've had a discussion. This isn't what a normal conversation or a healthy conversation looks like. So I just wanted to, um, to add that. Yeah, Eliza, I wanna bring you back into the conversation and talk specifically about online because you know, sort of building off of Sarah's personal experience, clearly social media plays a role in this, right? I, I mean, the there are, uh, chat functions in most games that kids play. Uh, TikTok is clearly, you know, a revolution, particularly during quarantine. Um, what, what are you seeing at NCMEC? What are some of the, what's some of the advice that you're giving parents and, and caregivers, you know, in order to allow kids to explore this online world, but explore it in a, in a safe, contained manner? Thanks so much for that question. And I feel like, um, you know, just in preparing for this conversation, not surprisingly, I, I heard a lot of those important messages already about honesty and real conversations about what to expect um, and having a safe place to talk about that. So proactively being willing to address the fact that um, there are predators online. And I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to jump into a little bit more of the geeky data, data stuff because Nick Mick has it. I um, it. But I, I want to reinforce, you know, one, that I use the term victim often when I'm speaking because it reflects the nature of a crime and the fact that a predator, a criminal committed a crime against a child, um, but that we know that uh, people who experience trafficking are surviving this and that it doesn't define who they are by any means. Mm -hmm. um, but also, and also I think on that predator point, when we talk about prevention, and it's something that I've always appreciated so much about darkness to light and other groups is the fact that we're saying, you know, we want to equip and empower young people to be able to protect themselves. But when we talk about prevention, we also need to say, you know, exploiting what are we raising kids or as humans or society to think we have the right to exploit another human being? It shouldn't be the onus on that child. And what I can tell you is while, like, as was kind of shared in general, especially on the typical cases reported as NICMIC, if there is a trafficker involved, that um, that is somebody that is already known to the child. But we are seeing a shift, um, especially, and you mentioned this earlier in your question, um, recently we've seen some very alarming trends as it relates to data in the time of COVID. So um, we looked at, basically we pulled numbers comparing 2019 and 2020 from uh, January 1st to September uh, 30th to kind of see what do the numbers look like. And not only did we see a comparison of our, and let me make sure I'm telling you the right numbers, um, over 11.2 million reports uh, in that first nine months through our cyber tip line in 2019 to in of 2020, over 18 million reports of online exploitation, and that could be child sex trafficking, online enticement, uh, sharing of con of unsolicited content, um, uh, means, and most importantly, you know, just like we're not no longer saying child pornography or child sex child prostitution, um, we'll say child sexual abuse materials, meaning um, formerly child pornography. But that piece of online enticement that Sarah was alluding to earlier, we saw the numbers go from about 15,000 in 2019 to over 30,000 in 2020. So double the amount of online enticement because kids are at home, people are at home, and there is just access to young people. And we know predators look where there are access to young people. Um, and certainly there has been an alarming trend 
both um, on social media, again, on online gaming and other places where people are saying, how can I look to those same indicators, that lack of stability, the lack of uh, support where I have an in to, you know, any child is at risk, but like it's already been said, there are things that put children at higher risk and a society that may set them up to support those factors. Um, so I, I did also want to say, you know, as I talk about the those numbers and what what the data means, um, that something that we're trying to change the narrative on with NICMIC as well is when we see numbers like that, um, we know that this this crime is expanding, right? Like it is getting bigger, but it also we're here trying to combat it, and I think we're trying to really debunk the idea that once an image is shared, you can never get it back. Um, so I did want to point out one resource as well that we have on our website. It's a little buried, but if you go to our main website and at the top, get help, and then are my images out there, we actually have a step-by-step -step, uh, process for multiple uh, social media platforms. So uh, Facebook, Twitter, Imgur, Instagram, all the ones that I'm too old to understand, um, but that will tell you if my if I believe my images are being shared on these platforms, here's the steps you need to take to get those down within each of those pieces. So that hopefully that's one other place to protect ourselves is knowing that that can be a tool for traffickers to exploit young people um, to be able to circumvent that. That's very helpful. I mean, I think, you know, I'd love for all of you to sort of talk about what do parents need to know? I think, Eliza, you you bring up really good points. Um, it, talking to your kids who are starting to date um, and, you know, what does it mean to take photos of yourself and send it to the person that you're interested in? Where do those photos go? How, you know, thinking that through, because I think initially, Sarah, as you were talking about that rush of feeling seen and um, and interesting and, you know, someone values who you are um, can be confused with safety. And so how do, how, how, do, how, do, how should parents talk to their kids and, and, and educate them on what it means to, to, to have that mobile phone in their hand? Nicole, you wanna jump on that? Oh, sure. I, did, I didn't know if it was Sarah first. Um, <laughs> well, well, number one, I think it's just very, honest for us all to acknowledge that the world that our children are growing up in is very different um, than the world we grew up in, or at least the world I grew up in. And so when we're talking about self sort of exploitation or sharing of nudes with romantic partners, what may be shocking and horrifying to us may also be part now, and I, this is not a judgment, good or bad, of where we are. What we at Childhood like to share is that while the digital world has no borders, your parenting should be in some respects the same in real life as it is online. You ask your children, where are they going? Hopefully you ask your children, who are their friends? Mm -hmm. Those are the same questions we need to ask online. Who are you speaking to? Can I see that? Um, you know. Uh, sharing personal anecdotes, I have an 11 year old, I folded during COVID and now she has a cell phone. I said we wouldn't do that until 13 or 14. Caitlin knows this is a true story. Um, but it's the same questions. Where are you going? Show me the games. It's not enough to tell our children to be responsible or to be aware of the fact that they're online groomers. You know, from young ages, they're taught don't say your name, don't share your address. But we also need to acknowledge that our groomers are getting smarter as well. And so they are transforming their behavior so that they are saying things like, yes, I am your age, or I know someone who goes to the same school as you, or I know that you probably don't feel comfortable meeting me privately. Let's meet in this public space. So their, their actions are changing with our work. So we as parents, as an adults, we have a responsibility to be that safety net. And being that safety net is first knowing where your children are, asking those questions, but most importantly, I would say, reacting responsibly to disclosures. Mm -hmm. We need to create environments where our children feel safe to share when they've done things that they're not proud of. They feel safe that they will be listened to, they will not be judged, because I would argue 
that it is the fear of judgment, the fear of being shamed or being in trouble that leads our children further down a rabbit hole um, that leads to greater unhappiness because they're so scared to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. So I think one of, the, one of the things that we share in childhood is that always be honest with your children, say, we all make mistakes, be okay to make mistakes, model that behavior, and then model the fact that I love you, I will always care for you, and it is my job to protect you even when you do something you might not be proud of. But I need you to have me in the conversation because ultimately my job is to keep you safe. I think that's a good first step. Such a great point. I've also heard, uh, you know, children say that they have not disclosed because they have heard their parents say that they would kill someone um, if they ever hurt their child. And the reality is they don't, children don't want to uh, put the people that they love at risk. And so if they disclose and they think that you are going to hurt them and go to jail, not only are they going to continue to be abused, but then they've lost the parent that is their safe or, or caregiver that is their safe adult. So, you know, as adults, we need to choose our words wisely uh, and, and allow our children to feel safe no matter what happens. Um, Sarah, you are nodding your head vigorously. Um, and so I just want to go to you and say, you know, I think people probably feel really nervous if someone discloses what are the things that we should be saying to uh, survivors of, of trafficking or exploitation? So it, the biggest and the hardest step is telling someone. When I sent sexually explicit images to this man on a social media platform, I it was impulsive. Um, and I instantly regretted it. But as we, someone brought up earlier, once you send an image, it's, it's out there. There's no taking it back. Mm -hmm. And I, it can, it can be, uh, excuse me. Okay. Um, Did we lose you? While she's waiting, Eliza, I want to go to you and sort of ask the same question. You know, I'm sure there are lots of parents who call in or if, even when they're calling in on the tip line, um, sort of asking, what do I do? Like, I suspect it and I'm not sure, you know, how do I behave? So what 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 do you train your people who talk on the tip line to, to say? Yeah, I mean, if a parent, if we're talking about a parent responding to this kind of behavior very much. I think Nicole hit the nail on the head of really reframing those conversations to be the what, not why. So, you know, create a place where already your child feels safe to say, I, this happened, like Sarah was talking about, like, I made this mistake and now I need your help. Um, and so, you know, similarly with, with child sex trafficking, you know, what made you want to leave to go see this person? Or, you know, what's not happening as opposed to why did you run again? Or why did you go to him is really important. But I also think for reporting broadly, I mean, one of the biggest things I can say is um, there's a lot of reasons that I think we talk ourselves out of making reports or information, especially young people. You know, we're realizing more and more that to get content, to be able to intervene in some of this type of exploitation and abuse, it's the children who are seeing it and can tell us about it. And so we want to let them know, like, don't talk yourself out of reporting it because what if you're right? And so, um, and similarly though, I think it's really important, especially in this time of kind of viral um, conspiracy theories, as well as really well um, intentions efforts to help that you also think along the lines of report it, don't share it. Um, we've definitely been seen, unfortunately, with that increase of cyber, cyber tips, et cetera, has to do with, oh, we heard this child's being exploited. Can you believe this video, et cetera, et cetera. And that person thinks they're helping, but inadvertently maybe re-exploiting that young person by sharing abusive content. Um, mm -hmm. Even if it doesn't fit the term of child pornography, we don't, we want to respect kids' privacy. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, you know, report information. But if you're, if you're unclear, like, I think what you've heard already is 
um, you don't have to come up with a conspiracy to try to intervene in child sex trafficking. Once you understand it, um, you can look to your own community. NCMEC has received reports of child sex trafficking in every state in the U.S. and suburban, tribal, urban land. Um, it's happening everywhere. We don't need to, to try to come up with these glamorized ideas, but I think um, so report as much information as possible, you know, aliases, truck stop, but you never know what little bit of information is going to help to uh, lead to a bigger case. We just had a case where we were able to intervene in child sex trafficking that was based on a photo um, where we were able to match the sink in the background of an online ad for the child to one hotel chain and then be able to make that connection with intelligence we already had to get that information back out to law enforcement. So number one, report the information to us. We are the clearinghouse, so we'll try to figure out if it's an emergency. Yeah. Um, and then number two, again, um, create an environment where your child feels safe talking to you about it and reporting that information. And I think, you know, when we see this glamorization and misinformation, those are teachable moments to talk to our kids about those misconceptions and why um, they have a role in combating exploitation. Yeah, I um, I mean, I know what's on everyone's mind when we say conspiracy theory is QAnon. Um, we could probably have a whole hour long discussion <laughs> on QAnon itself. Um, I know there is a general um, distaste for QAnon uh, amongst professionals in this environment because of the misinformation and the fact that um, while well-intentioned, um, trying to seek you know, help for survivors, the majority of information that is shared is misinformation in the QAnon movement. Um, and it has done nothing but hurt those who are currently um, being victimized or survivors um, who are on the journey of healing. And so, uh, I, will, I will kind of leave that there because I think we would talk too long about that. And there are lots of questions in the chat. Um, I think I went 37 directions from your one question up. It's a tendency I have. <laughs> you're fine, you're fine. Um, but I, I recognize, and I always, I always tell my team an hour is never long enough because everyone that joins um, just says the most amazing things. But um, there are a couple questions. One, there were a number of questions about you know, what are the trainings and the resources? People are asking about resources. I will speak specifically to Darkness to Light. We have partnered with an organization called the Monique Burr Foundation. We have a joint um, campaign called Prevent360. You can go to prevent360.org. Um, one of the reasons we love the Monique Burr Foundation is because they also uh, uh, believe that it is an adult's responsibility. However, uh, they focus on educating the child so that when a child does disclose, they have the information. One of the things we talked about earlier was red flags and grooming. Um, part of their five safety rules is, you know, spotting red flags. And so it's a school-based curriculum. You know, please check them out. Check out Prevent 360. Um, they do talk about child sexual um, exploitation, commercial sexual exploitation bullying, uh, child sexual abuse. So they're definitely a great curriculum. So for those of you who are interested in that, um, please check out Prevent360 or mbfprevention.org. Um, I wanna talk, there is a question about, um, you know, TikTok, back to TikTok. And this person is sort of saying, I know we talked about it a little bit, but it, it's been a large concern for them. And they're wondering if, you know, the fact that parents aren't doing anything about it if it were if it warrants cps a cps report if parents don't intervene um you know if there is something going on and so that's an interesting question we obviously talk a lot about reporting based on um in-person grooming and in-person activity but do you know are you supposed to report um a parent who is not actively engaging in helping their child uh stay safe online Um, well, I'll take a stab at that, but I'll, I'll say it's a question I haven't received before, so I wish I had some opportunity to think about it a little bit more. Um, you know, every state is different as far as abuse and neglect laws, so I think that's an important component as well. But again, you know, it is such a fine line, and um, uh, the unfortunate truth is that Nick McGetts reports sometimes it says, you know, I saw a black adult with a white child, so 
we wanted to report that, right? Like we recognize it, but reinforcing the idea that again, that's why we exist as a clearinghouse. Like everything that comes to us will go back to law enforcement, but we're able to frame that level of emergency. So if there is concern that a child is at immediate risk because a parent isn't taking action, um, I think report that information. And if, especially if it is, um, so if I didn't say it before, it's cybertipline.org to make a report, or if you uh, aren't remembering that 1-800 the lost, I know there are other mechanisms. I mean, 911, if that child is in immediate danger, of course, um, or I hope, of course. Um, but I think that um, it, it is better to say, you know, if anything, if you have information about who might be that exploiter, maybe we have information um, to be able to tie that to other kids getting abused. Now we know one more child is at risk. So, you know, err, err on the side of over-reporting and, and hopefully our, our team will be able to weed that out. Awesome. Sarah, um, it looks like we got you back. Uh, <laughs> I, there is a question for you from the audience. Uh, she, Karen wants to know if you could help share what helped you get out of your situation. Was it an organization, a person? Like, how did you transition out of, um, you know, the, the trafficking experience? Oh, you're on mute. It was a process. Um, I, so one thing at the time, I did not register that I was being humanly trafficked. It was not something that, you know, was even a thought in my head. Um, so honestly, I had to go through a huge wave of emotions um, to be able to get to the point where I took this feeling of, you know, shame and guilt and fear. And I, I had to make the decision that to not feel like this anymore. I couldn't. It was suffocating. And I, I can't tell you how many times I tried to reach out to people and I deleted every message. But there was one moment there was, all it took was one moment. And I sent that message and eight hours later, eight or nine hours later, um, someone drove from Boston to New York City and came and rescued me. It was, I didn't leave my house for six months when I came home. I, I refused. I was terrified. I was terrified that if I stepped outside, I would see one of my traffickers. And I still battle with that to this day. You know, a survivor is always a survivor. You wake up every day a survivor. And every day you make the choice to better yourself, to educate people, and that's why I speak out. I speak out because my story has power. I took my power back and now I have the ability to help other people. And that's the greatest gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible that you use your platform the way that you do. Um, it's, it's definitely, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of grit. And I think what you're doing to help others um, in your similar situation is is outstanding. So we're honored to have you here and thank you so much for your courage and your willingness to to share things that I'm sure um, are difficult to talk about. So um, I want to, uh, we have seven minutes, which I'm so sad because I could talk to you all forever, but I really, I, I wanna hear from each of you, you know, what is one thing that you wanna leave parents for advocates um, to think about around this issue in particular uh, and, and how to prevent it. So uh, Nicole, I'll, I'll jump to you first. <laughs> oh, you caught me. I thought I would be able to hear Eliza and Sarah first. Um, I would say simply have the conversation whatever space you're in, have the conversation as parents, have the conversation as children, have the conversations in your workplace. You know, I think it's so important to have the conversation, 
but recognize again that these are conversations in childhood we partner with organizations like NetClean so that we're making sure that employees are not accessing child sexual abuse materials. We support grassroots and innovative programs that are not just culturally competent, but are culturally relevant. Mm -hmm. um, so just have the conversation and never stop talking because it's just, it lives in silence because we, you know, we have an advocacy platform where we say eyes wide open and it's important for us to not only open our, open our eyes, talk about it and then do something about it. And I think that was more than the one thing I wanted to say, but. That's fine. It was great. I loved it. Um, uh, Sarah, you want to talk, what is one thing that you would leave caregivers with? I, I really agree with Nicole. I think the most important thing is if you heard something today you're not familiar with, look it up. Do a Google image search, ask a friend, go to NICMEC, go to the website. It's important to be armed with information because mm -hmm. when we have a lack of information, we can't help ourselves and we can't help other people. Mm -hmm. So educate, 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 educate yourself, educate your friends, you know, bring up this conversation, ask, ask your friend, hey, do you, do you know, have you heard of what grooming is? You know, break the ice, break the barrier, um, destigmatize this. That's what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. And Eliza, I will end with you. What do you think? What is the one thing that you hope that um, parents, caregivers, advocates will walk away from today? Yeah, I mean, you know, Nicole, you said you didn't want to go first. Um, hard hard to go last that same way and i think sarah <laughs> you um you really reinforced something that i was i was hoping to mention as well I, you know it's amazing 15 years later um and all these speaking engagements i still have such a hard time answering that very simple question um, and mm -hmm. sort of the root question but as my as our training team has taught me and would uh tell me not to forget to mention that last week we uh, released our first online module curriculum specifically on uh, child sex trafficking response and how to report it. So if I forgot a piece, I'm pretty sure they remembered to put it there. <laughs> um, but that, um, you know, we are building the plane as we fly it. And, um, and I think the reason that I feel confident in saying that I am an expert or can speak on this is because I've made so many mistakes um, and, and will continue. But that, that like Sarah said, that that education is power and knowledge is power, but also kind of those um, rules too, to remember to be kind to yourself. These are really hard pieces and we're learning together. So um, if this happens, God forbid, we talked a lot about the prevention, but you're not alone. There are uh, support networks, peer groups out there to say, you know, we are there. This has happened to my child too. Um, and so um, I don't let the fear um, prevent you from the healing because I think Sarah is such a great example of just because this happens that it doesn't mean that there's not a bright future and a resilient kid who will thrive and give back. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. I uh, normally take moderator privilege and wrap up, but Eliza, I think you did a great job. Um, what I will end with is just a thanks to all of you who joined us today. You know, this is a really important topic, clearly. We have a month dedicated to it and individuals out there um, to keep safe. There were a lot of questions, unfortunately, that we did not have time to get to today. If you do want those answers, uh, feel free to email stewards at d2l, the number 2l.org. Um, and, and get those questions answered. I know that you can also go to our, uh, our fellow organizations, NICMIC and World Childhood um, for additional information. And again, um, there are you know, places you can go and talk to someone today, 1-866-4LIGHT uh, is the free resource, or you can text 741-741, the, the word LIGHT, and, uh, and someone will be there to help you walk through everything. So again, Sarah, Eliza, Nicole, um, you all were absolutely wonderful. It was an honor and a pleasure to have you on our Honest Conversation series. And uh, for those who are interested, it will be on our YouTube uh, channel in a couple of days, and we will also have translated it into Spanish. So 
Thank you all. Have a wonderful week. And uh, thank you for the work you do and the courage that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.